going to speak about, he's going to speak about uh, exploring carotenoid mediated photophysics in plants with ultra broad, broadband 2D electronic spectroscopy. So please feel free to uh, share your screen and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Thomas. And thanks to you and Maxim for uh, organizing the seminar to kind of bridge us across this challenging time. So I'm you know, honored to be a part of it and on this occasion of the very last one. Also, thank you for putting this at a convenient time um, for both of us. All right, so the stories that I'm going to talk about today are all about looking at the photophysics in plants. And so we're motivated to understand the role of carotenoids in these photophysics um, because as uh, many, if not all of us know, photosynthesis powers most life on Earth. So that is well established, but what isn't so well established is how. How is it that photosynthetic organisms are able to capture sufficient energy to achieve this remarkable feat? So if we're going to think about how they get enough energy, we can start by thinking about where the energy is coming from. So uh, here's the solar spectrum at the Earth's surface. And we can overlay this with the absorption spectrum of light harvesting complex 2, or LHG2, the primary antenna protein that absorbs light in green plants. It's the protein that makes leaves green and the protein that I'll be talking about um, for this entire talk. So if we look at this spectrum, we can see that it spans uh, the blue and the red side of the solar spectrum. So, you know, LHG2 is able to absorb across the visible region, but along with that comes a challenge, which is that um, it is the low energy states that drive charge separation, water splitting, all of the biochemistry of photosynthesis. But that means that energy absorbed from the blue needs to relax across an energy gap greater than 50 kT. So one of the things we wanted to understand is how does that relaxation happen? How does it happen quickly and efficiently despite that large energy gap? Now the other question that we're going to address today is so we know that that energy relaxes quickly and efficiently and all the energy moves on to drive charge separation under low light conditions. Um, but sometimes it is sunny out. So under those cases, the photophysics change um, because what can happen is the chlorophylls can generate um, singlet oxygen and which can cause damage to the proteins. So instead, the photophysics uh, change to activate non-radiative decay pathways uh, that convert that absorbed energy into heat. And so we also wanna know can we understand more about what those dissipative pathways are? Okay, so if we want to think about these two things, we can begin by looking at the molecular structure of LHG2. So here the protein is shown in gray and the pigments are shown um, in green for the chlorophyll and in pink for the carotenoids. And we see that these pigments are packed densely within this protein scaffold. They all neighbor each other, but if we look at the absorption spectrum, we can see that the transitions are spectrally separated. And so these transitions, so these pigments that neighbor each other in space are separated uh, uh, in terms in spectrum, in spectral uh, domain. And so we wanna understand what are their photophysics to understand how they're interacting or what role their interactions are playing. So of course that means we need a probe that maps out the photophysics across the visible. And of that probe of, is, uh, I should come to no surprise to anybody given the title of the seminar, 2D electronic spectroscopy. And so what we really need though, is a 2D uh, spectrum that encompasses both the carotenoid and the chlorophyll transition so that we can understand the dynamics of uh, both of those states and how the carotenoids transfer energy to the chlorophyll. And so in order to do this, we need the femtosecond resolution, we need broad bandwidth, and we also need a high signal to noise ratio. So these are proteins. Um, sometimes it can be challenging to make many proteins and they can be damaged. So we need to often do these experiments at low power. 
And so reconciling these two final criteria, broadband within high signal to noise ratio, experimentally can often be challenging. Um, now, 2D spectroscopy can have high sensitivity, but when you get to broadband with many white light sources fluctuate due to the nature of the white light generation. So that means that detecting these kinds of broadband spectra can be challenging. And so it's just because of that challenge that many of uh, the, the previous work on LHC2, so there's been a lot of really beautiful 2D uh, measurements on LHC2, um, some of the uh, groups are listed there, but, and so that work has been beautiful, has given us a lot of understanding of the dynamics of the chlorophyll, but it's really just focused on the region around the chlorophyll Q states. And so what we set out to do is think about ways we can expand that spectral bandwidth to cover the carotenoid transitions and understand the dynamics between the carotenoids and the chlorophyll. All right, so how we do 2D spectroscopy is we do it in the fully non-collinear geometry. Um, and so that leads to generation of our signal, um, as I'm sure everyone in the audience is familiar with, in a spatially separated background free direction in order to get this high sensitivity. But as many people have undoubtedly experienced, along with detection of the signal, we often detect scatter. Now, traditionally, that scattering component is removed um, through slow subtraction. Um, and that means that many of the, fluctu the fluctuations in the, in the uh, laser system aren't fully subtracted. And so um, this is some quantification. So we, in order for simplicity of our setup, we generate our white light in an argon tube and that gives us an ultra broadband setup. But then if we take our 2D spectrum, this is a 2D spectrum on Nile blue, just to characterize the setup, we can characterize the signal to noise. So we do this in the time domain where we compare the fluctuations at, for a long uh, coherence or T1 time to the amplitude of the signal um, at short times. And what we find is a signal to noise ratio of around 10, which is not that great. So what we did is we uh, integrated into our setup a high speed detector and choppers. So there have been various approaches um, to do shot-to-shot uh, -shot or single-shot spectral acquisition. We did it this way because it's easy. So we put choppers in and with a high-speed camera, we were able to detect, um, do background subtraction on a shot-to-shot -shot basis. And that allowed us to remove the scattering component faster than many fluctuations. So although this is a simple addition to our setup, what we can see if we similarly characterize the signal to noise ratio is we've got about a 15 fold improvement in signal to noise ratio. So like I said, there have been various approaches um, to do uh, more rapid background detection as many of you know very well. Um, and some of them have even higher enhancements. But what this got us is with this simple addition to the setup, 15 fold improvement, which was a significant improvement in the quality of the data that we could collect. So with his apparatus in hand, we can go back to LHC2 and record 2D spectra that span both the carotenoid and the chlorophyll transitions. And with this, we can address these two questions that I posed at the beginning, which are, how does energy efficiently relax across the large gap? And how is excess energy dissipated? So I'm going to start off thinking about this first one, in particular, how these blue states then transfer energy into these chlorophyll states. And so if we want to think about this, we can go back to the structure and think a little bit first about what is the electronic structure that we're talking about. And so I have this simplified Jablonski diagram on the left. And so what we're fundamentally looking at is say we absorb it to the blue states like the S2 of the carotenoid, this energy relaxation to the chlorophyll Q states over this greater than 50 kT. And so if we want to understand that relaxation, an important part is understanding the electronic structure of the carotenoids because these states on these individual pigments span this region. But understanding the electronic structure of the carotenoids is a very hard problem. It has, a lot of people have done a lot of work 
trying to understand this, it is very challenging because while the S2 state is bright, the S1 state is dark. And there are debates about the presence of additional dark states and trying to identify additional dark states, if any, as well as their, what their energies are, is hard because they are dark. And so along with this challenge of trying to determine the electronic structure of carotenoids, well, that's also a generalization because the electronic structure is variable. So these are long conjugated polyenes and sort of key to this challenge is they are floppy. They are sensitive to their, their conjugated system is sensitive to their environment. So the structure can change. In the case of LHC2, there are two lutenes, which are in the center of the protein, showing them here colored in pink, they are chemically identical molecules. And in fact, the protein won't fold without the presence of carotenoids in these positions. But despite the fact that they're chemically identical, the difference in their protein pocket means that their S2 state is shifted by 700 wave numbers. And there's likely a similar shift in their dark states. So that tells us that um, trying to understand the electronic structure is challenging and there may not just be one answer. So if we really wanna understand these photophysical processes, one aspect of this is thinking about what are the photophysical roles of these differences between these two lutenes. Okay, and so to look at that, we go back to our 2D spectrum um, where I'm now showing the transitions just to sticks. And we can start off thinking about the dynamics in this um, blue region of the spectrum, which wasn't previously characterized with 2D spectroscopy. And so this is a zoom in of that region of the spectrum. And what we saw here was something that was actually pretty surprising. We see cross peaks within this region, despite the fast dynamics um, on carotenoid. So there's very fast S2 to S1 internal conversion. What we see is cross peaks from the chlorophyll serrae and from lutein one that tell us that those pigments are actually transferring to one of the other carotenoids, lutein two. So these are the waiting time traces of those cross peaks. And we see this fast grow in of these cross peaks on sub 100 femtosecond time scales. So this is telling us that there was this previously uncharacterized relaxation amongst the blue states in LHC2 that precedes energy transfer, in, or in some cases precedes energy transfer to the red states. And so we see that this, these energy transfer processes lead to this essentially collection of energy on lutein 2. And so in thinking about how energy efficiently relaxes across a large energy gap, we see that there's initially energy from the higher line states onto lutein 2. And it was actually previously proposed in the observation of this redshift of the lutein 2 transition that that redshift may play a role in facilitating um, energy relaxation from the blue states down to the chlorophyll Q bands. Okay, so now we can go back to our 2D spectrum and think about can we understand, um, can we measure more directly energy transfer from the higher line states to the lower line states? And so then we want to zoom in on this region of our 2D spectrum here, where we can directly monitor carotenoid to chlorophyll energy transfer. So here's a zoom in of this region of the spectrum. And so the, as we know, the cross peak intensity reflects the strength of the energy transfer pathway. So to try and compare the strength of energy transfer from the, loop, from the different carotenoids, we can actually integrate um, <clears throat> this region of the spectrum. And what we see is the energy transfer from the carotenoids and notably a more, more significant cross peak from lutein two than lutein one, which tells us that lutein two is transferring energy more efficiently to the chlorophyll Q states than lutein one. Although there is some component of energy transfer from lutein one. So in thinking about how energy efficiently relaxes across this large gap, we see that lutein 2 is primarily transferring energy to the chlorophyll. Now, both of those observations uh, ended up seeing something about uh, photophysics involving lutein 2. So to look more directly at the relaxation pathways of lutein 2, we can take a slice of our 2D spectrum at the excitation energy of lutein 2. So we take a slice of the 2D spectrum 
and this excitation energy for all our different waiting time traces. So we excite the lutein 2s2 state and we subtract the decay. Um, and so what we see is this oscillation. And so this is a backbone vibration of the carotenoid. It's a reporter oscillation. Um, because what's notable in this oscillation is that we see, if we characterize this oscillation, we see that there's a phase minimum, uh, oh, sorry, a phase jump along with an amplitude minimum at 18,500 wave numbers. And so this energy is the energy of a previously proposed um, uh, dark state termed SX within the carotenoids um, bound to the light harvesting complexes. And what, the, what this, these signatures of this oscillation are consistent with is the bottom of a potential energy well. And we see this bottom of the potential energy well at 18,500 wave numbers after exciting into the lutein 2 S2 state. So this, these observations are consistent with a non-adiabatic transition from the lutein 2 S2 state into a state with the bottom of the potential energy well at 18,500 wave numbers. And we note that we can start to observe these oscillations at 20 femtoseconds. So that suggests there's an that this non-adiabatic transition occurs incredibly quickly. And then just to kind of recap, so, and then we're, what we're seeing here is this oscillation within the potential energy well of lutein 2. And as we oscillate back and forth, depending on what side of the bottom of the potential energy well, that wave packet will either be at a minimum or a maximum, which is what gives rise to this phase jump, which is, the, which is a spectroscopic signature of the bottom of the potential energy well. All right, so that tells us that we've, so these observations are consistent with the observation of a uh, state SX exclusively on lutein 2. We further uh, looked at this using global analysis of the 2D spectrum. And one of the components of our global analysis on a 60 femtosecond component, we were able to resolve a positive cross peak at that energy of SX. Um, along with negative uh, features with the S2 state. So that's consistent with the decay of the S2 state along with a rise of a cross peak at that energy of SX. So this tells us that we've been able to identify these signatures of an SX state. And we saw this SX state exclusively on lutein 2. If we do the same analysis at the excitation energy of lutein 1 or any of the other carotenoids, we do not observe these features. So this tells us that this lutein 2 SX state at this energy here is, is sensitive to the conformation of the luteins or the electrostatics of the protein binding pocket. So the next thing we wanted to think about is what is the role of this identified SX state in energy relaxation. And so to think about that, we can look at this region of our 2D spectrum here, which shows us SX to chlorophyll energy transfer. And we can look at this region and take a very narrow slice through it. And what we observe here is a rise on around 300 femtosecond timescale, which suggests that that SX state is then transferring energy to the chlorophyll on around 300 femtosecond timescale. So overall, these experiments have identified this debated dark state exclusively on lutein 2 and seen that it may play a role in facilitating carotenoid to chlorophyll energy transfer, essentially providing a different, another intermediate state to bridge that gap from the red to the blue. Okay, so in thinking about these central questions using our ultra broadband 2D spectroscopy of how does energy efficiently relax across a large gap, we've been able to resolve these dynamics consistent with lutein 2 serving as this nexus for light harvesting to facilitate relaxation across a large energy gap. But then the next question is thinking about how is it that excess energy could be dissipated as heat? 
And so in going back to our picture of the electronic structure, so far we've been talking about this energy transfer pathway, the specific photophysical states and time scales involved. And that's key to light harvesting. But we also want to understand under highlight intensities, the dissipation. How is it that these chlorophyll Q states get back to the ground state uh, through these dissipative non-radiative pathways? And so one likely culprit in this is carotenoids because carotenoids have a uh, very rapid non-radiative decay on a tens of picos 10 picosecond-ish time scale um, where the S1 state decays rapidly back down to the ground state. And so they're likely involved in dissipation. And indeed, there have been many proposals about uh, their role in dissipation. There's been proposals of chlorophyll to carotenoid energy transfer. Um, and so this would be a straightforward mechanism where you have the chlorophyll that then transfer energy to the carotenoid S1 state, but then rapidly non-radiatively decays to the S0 state. But it has not been directly, it had not been directly observed in measurements. Another proposal that emerged was a proposal of a delocalized chlorophyll and carotenoid excited state. So this proposal is that there's mixing between the chlorophyll uh, states, uh, the chlorophyll Q states, and the carotenoid S1 state. And so then those, some of those chlorophyll Q states adopt some of that S1 character that enables the rapid non-radiative decay. So there were some spectroscopic signatures um, that were observed consistent with that mechanism, um, although there's some debate over that. Uh, but it requires stronger coupling between the chlorophyll and the carotenoids than you would naively predict from structural models. And so a lot of the reason these are still open questions is because the dynamics of the dark S1 state you know, can't be probed directly. But what you can measure is the excited state absorption from the S1 state to the SN manifold. And so, where, and so in order to look at this, and to benchmark these dissipative photophysics, we took another chunk of our 2D spectrum to, to look for this chlorophyll to carotenoid energy transfer, if any. And so if we look at this, zoom in on this region of the 2D spectrum, and we specifically look at what happens upon excitation of the low energy chlorophyll states, we can look at the, at the carotenoid S1 ESA. And what we see here is a rise on a 400 femtosecond time scale. And if we look at the chlorophyll Q states, we see a correlated decay on the same 400 femtosecond time scale. So this correlated decay and rise is indicative of a directional energy transfer rather than a delocalized excited state, which would have an instantaneous rise. So in thinking about how excess energy is dissipated, what we've been able to do is observe this dissipative chlorophyll to carotenoid energy transfer. But what's notable is that there had previously been some predictions um, of some simulations of the chlorophyll to carotenoid energy transfer, which had suggested a 10 picosecond-ish time scale from chlorophyll to, the, to carotenoid energy transfer, whereas our measurements were 400 femtoseconds. So we see that this energy transfer process is happening around 10 times faster than theoretical predictions. Now, one reason for that may be uh, related to the challenges around actually calculating the coupling between the chlorophyll and the carotenoids because of the conjugated nature of um, the electronic states of the carotenoids. Um, and so it may be essentially a local coupling, which may be stronger than the, than the coupling if you were in the far field. So essentially a near field effect. So in thinking about how excess energy is dissipated as heat, uh, what we've been able to do is observe um, energy transfer from the chlorophyll to the carotenoid S1 states, which could be a dissipated pathway that in vivo gets enhanced to provide this non-radiative decay back down to the ground state. And um, from some CD measurements, we were able to see that this dissipative chlorophyll to carotenoid energy transfer likely involves lutein-1. 
So thinking back to our structure of LHC2, we see these two chemically identical pigments in the center of this protein. And we see that one has these electronic states that facilitate relaxation to play this critical role in light harvesting. But the other chemically identical pigment serves as an acceptor, um, potentially for dissipation. So these suggest that these carotenoids may have their electronic structure optimized by their protein pocket that may further tune their function for light harvesting or photoprotection, respectively. All right, so that's all I wanted to tell you about today. Um, I'm going to end by thanking the, um, everybody who actually uh, did the work. So. The experiments that I told you about today were all led by a really phenomenal former graduate student in my group, Min Jung Sun, who built the apparatus, performed the 2D measurements, who is now a postdoc with Marty Zani at Madison. And all of the LHC2 was provided through a close collaboration with Roberto Bassi at University of Verona and Alberto Pinola at University of Pavia. I just want to make sure to really acknowledge uh, their contributions, not only of the sample, but of great discussions to provide the biological perspective. Um, the DOE keeps our lights on, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so the talk is indeed open for questions, and I think, let me see, there's a question from Xing Yun Wang. You can unmute yourself, Xing Yun. Yes, yes. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> so, uh, well, morning. Good morning, Professor Slow Cohen. So thank you for your great uh, presentation. I'm really impressed by your research. I'm a PhD student studied with the uh, two node clarins and uh, Don Donatas in Lund University, Sweden. <laughs> so I also major uh, research the 2D electronic spectroscopy and uh, photosynthetic proteins. I, I have two questions, small questions. Uh, First, I think your set, uh, your two D setup is really advanced. So now I wonder if we can use this setup to detect the dynamic or excited state in FMO or RC proteins. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, so you know, our two D setup was actually. There are certainly people who have more advanced two D set setups than we do. We actually built this for simplicity um where yeah. we just all we do is focus our laser into an argon tube without a hollow core fiber or anything so that it's really robust from day to day um okay. so it it certainly could be widely used um and that was one of our goals in building it was a facile apparatus um so the other thing uh and so right now because our setup is not designed to focus on the FMO transitions at 800 okay. nanometers. Um, we actually removed the residual from the fundamental before, but some similar chopping schemes could, could be used. Oh, okay, and the uh, second question, uh, Professor, I have read a lot of your paper about the 2D and the proteins like LHC2, and I know you have got great success in figuring out how to absorb and uh, transfer energy with, with, within photosynthetic proteins, which is very impressive to me. <laughs> so I also want to know if we can research more counter effects of proteins with, yeah, in your uh, setup, for example, counter beating, very slow beating and uh, electronic beating, yeah. Um, yeah, um, it is, it is certainly possible. Uh, there are definitely setups that are better designed for yeah. that than ours because we use a beam splitter. Um, so, and a sort of core stage, we, we designed our setup to really look at, um, population dynamics. So, you know, we have a stage that has a yeah. longer delay time. Um, so, I would say some people who have designed setups where they have a delay, a shorter but more precise delay stage for the waiting time for the T2 time 
are uh, better suited to look at those dynamics than, than we are. Okay, thank you. Have a nice uh, summer holiday. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. Otherwise, I see no hands at the moment, so I will just shoot myself. Um, so you are not really discussing polarization uh, of the laser pulses. Are you using different polarizations? And do you think you could learn something more from, from analyzing polarization sensitive data? Yeah, so we were here using all parallel polarization. Um, uh, I think, you know, polarization could definitely be a powerful tool. As you could see, we had a lot of overlapping features. So, for example, if we to more directly observe SX or some of the dynamics around SX, we may be able to suppress some of the, the diagonal features. Um, there, you know, I think some people have started to think about ways that you could also use aligned samples and then polarization. Um, there's, you know, been some recent work on LHC2, uh, not ultra fast, but looking at some of the aligned CD and that has allowed you to essentially uh, really figure out a little bit more about what the, what disentangling the molecular structure. Okay, I think there's a question now from Zoom and Gosh. Suman, you're please speak up. Ask your question. Okay, while, while Solomon okay. is, is prepared, I know I'm muting the mic or, or just looking for a mic, I don't know. Uh, can I ask, Gabriela, I have a very simple question. I, I like that, that very much when you are talking, uh, well, people begin to talk uh, to the uh, energy relaxation. Well, because that's why of my favorite questions, where does the energy go to? Uh, so, uh, so here, if you are talking about the uh, local temperature, Right again, I don't know. I don't know how to uh, define the local environment here. But let's say that um, right after the relaxation, okay, of uh, one excitation, what the local temperature would be? Yeah. So, um, so you mean right after the dissipation of one excitation yes, into the exactly. environment? Yeah. So the local temperature may transiently heat. Uh, in, we're in a buffer solution, so in around, I think Dwayne Miller and Thomas Elsacier showed that that in around 50 femtoseconds that tends to dissipate. So I imagine it's a very transient temperature jump um, that, and the reason why I say that time scale is because uh, that presumably is faster than any kind of slow and harmonic motion. So you couldn't have any kind of massive unfolding. Um, of course, that's a little bit speculative, right? Because we can't actually follow it, but that's what I have, that's the assumption that I've operated under that you have this local heating effect and then um, that has led to, uh, and, but then that dissipates before you can have any protein denaturation or anything. Now, in the actual organism, there's some of that, but, but actually you have several excitations and a high density of protein and some of it is confined. So there have been observations of temperature increases um, through some IR measurements um, under high light intensities, likely due to this dissipation process. So it does seem to increase the local temperature within the lumen in the organism by up to 10 degrees, which I also thought was interesting because these these photoprojective processes, the light regulation, like the pH component and the temperature are actually coupled, right? There's a temperature component of some of this response too. So, uh, but that is very complicated biology that is hard to disentangle. Okay, thank you. I think that Solomon now is, yes. Yeah, so um, thank you for the nice talk. So 
so both the energy transfer for light harvesting and photoprotection effects is like in ultra fast time scale so i was wondering how the carotenoid uh, maintain managed to make the balance like uh, and uh, is that why they have the two carotenoids in it i mean can you please comment on that yeah you know i think we're all wondering how they managed to make that balance um I would say that's why they have the two carotenoids. That may also be why they have um, different, uh, that may also, the, their different electronic states may also be playing some of these different roles. You know, for example, in LUT2, where we showed that the S2 state and the SX state are playing this key role in facilitating energy relaxation. Well, their S1 state is similarly redshifted along with their S2 state or likely. And so you don't see any S1 to chlorophyll energy transfer. And, you know, S2 to S1 to chlorophyll is a minor pathway in LHC2, you know, maybe 10 to 15% of the energy transfer. But um, whereas lutein one, their S1 state, because it's higher in energy, does actually transfer some energy to the chlorophyll Q. So that's to say, even if we characterize some of their states as having these opposing roles, there may be different behavior of other states. Um, and John Kennis at Vu has done some work characterizing those S1 states. I see, thank you. Any other questions? So maybe I can ask as well. So the, you, you said this uh, a bit about the sample now. Um, so can you explain exactly what the conditions are? So it, it, this is not an, uh, say, performed exactly uh, directly on the leaf, but what is the exact sample uh, setup that you have? Sure, yeah. So this, um, so LHC2 is a membrane protein. So we add detergent. Um, for the materials people, we add soap. And that soap essentially solubilizes that membrane protein. Now, in some experiments that I didn't talk about today, we can also take, we've also taken LHC2 and we've embedded it in a membrane and seen that that actually enhances that dissipative pathway, which suggests that other environmental factors could enhance it under high light conditions. Um, so in the experiments I talked about, they were all in detergent, but we have done a lot of work also kind of characterizing the membrane. And in some other work using actually single molecule spectroscopy to try and understand the conformational states and of LHC2 and how they're influenced by these factors, we looked at different model membranes, liposomes, which have sort of a more curved area, nanodisks, which are flatter, different size nanodisks, which have different lateral membrane pressures and different lipid compositions. And we saw that the conformational states of LHC2 were affected by all of these different factors, in fact. Um, so all of these things likely further fine tune the photophysics. Yeah, yeah. So it matters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? If not, then uh, thank you very much, Gabriella, for this uh, very final talk.